Fans, if you're into sports betting, Bet Online is where you should go to win money today. Whether it's live bets during games or futures for who you think's going to win the championship, Bet Online has all the latest odds, news, and information for all of your online sports betting needs. Visit the website today or use your mobile device to join and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. So before the next big game, head on over to Bet Online and start playing today. Bet Online, your online sportsbook experts. Welcome again, everybody. Mike and Mark with you. And our guest is one of the best defensive first basemen, really, of all time. Our guest won six straight gold gloves. And, Mark, you played with and against J.T. Snow. How good was he? Uh, incredible first baseman. And uh, you think of defense first. Uh, with some players, Mike, J.T. Snow identified the position at first base. It's not just throwing someone over there. J.T. was very athletic. He was a very accurate thrower. And those gold gloves were earned because J.T. Snow uh, defined that position if you look at it. J.T., really appreciate the time. Wonderful career for you. Uh, 16 seasons in the big leagues. You had some wonderfully special moments in the postseason. But when you look back at it all, is there a moment to you that resonates most, your signature time? Well, thanks for having me on and uh, glad to talk to you guys. Uh, You know, there's so many moments over your career and um, you look back and the the years you spent in the minor leagues and the big leagues, but I'm always a big guy. I always go back to, to my first. And I think for me, it was my first call up. I was drafted by the Yankees out of the university of Arizona, uh, 1989. And uh, we were, we were pac 10 champs uh, fifth round by the Yankees. And then just, grinded my way through the organization, went to short season and went to a ball, double a, triple a. And for me talking about the first, uh, it's my first call up. Uh, I was called up to the Yankees 1992. I was playing in Columbus. We won the international league championship. And then I think six or seven guys off that team got called up. So, uh, one day I'm in Columbus, Ohio, the next day actually flew to Kansas city. And, uh, for me, that was it. It was my first call up getting to a big league clubhouse. Um, I always remember my first hit, my first home run, uh, things like that. So that's that's what's important because it 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 signifies all the years you you, you grinded since you were a kid in little league and, and high school and college minor league. So you, you realize your dream. So um, yeah, my my first Gold Glove. I always look back to to the first. Uh, JT, if you look at it too, um, uh, you had a very good year in AAA. Did you anticipate that call? Did you almost realize, you know what, I'm getting close. I know it's coming. Or did it surprise you? And who told you first? How'd that go down? Well, I was lucky enough to, um, and you know this, Mark, I, I was improving each year and I had my best year in AAA, which the timing was perfect. Uh, I played on a great AAA team with the Yankees in Columbus. Uh, if you go, if you go around the horn, uh, Brad Ausmus was our catcher. I played first. Dave Silvestri was our shortstop. He played in the big leagues was a, a Olympic on the U S Olympic team. Hensley Mullins, Bam Bam was our third baseman. And then in our outfit, we had Gerald Williams in center and Bernie Williams in, in right field. So we had six or seven big leaguers uh, on that team that had careers. We kind of knew we were getting called up. Uh, our manager was Rick down at the time, the late Rick down, who was a great hitting guy in the big leagues. And he basically told us, but they left us together to play to win the championship because the Yankees were big on winning championships in the minor league. So they kept us together. We went to the International League uh, finals. And uh, after that series, we, I think we played two series. So after the second series, we got called up and we all spent about 16 days in the big leagues. It, it cost us a couple of weeks, but that was the Yankees philosophy to keep the team together. We worked so hard and um it's amazing how you remember numbers. That that team in Columbus that year, we finished 101 and 51. We were wow. 50 games over 500. We never lost a series all year in two or three game series or, or three or four game series. We either won two or three. Uh, we split in a four game series or we won three or four. So we did, we had an awesome team and um, and uh, yeah, I still remember like yesterday. Brad Ausmus got the winning hit against Scranton. Wilkes Bear Red Barons to win the National League <laughs> title, and uh, it was a little flare over the second baseman's head. Scored the guy from second base. So, um, yeah, we had a, we had a great team in, in Columbus, and the I think those six or seven guys we all went up to the big leagues the next day. 
Was there a particularly meaningful conversation you had with anybody when you did get that official word and you knew, Harry, you know what, tomorrow we're on a plane to a different world entirely? Yeah, Rick, Rick Down called us in after the game and we were celebrating. We clinched it at home in Columbus and then uh, we all flew the next morning and the Yankees were in Kansas City. So we flew to Kansas City. Um, you know, back then, you got to remember, there, there's no cell phones. There's no... Um, FaceTime. So I called my parents that night. I said, I'm going to the big leagues tomorrow. And I didn't get any sleep. We all flew the next day to Kansas city, check into the hotel. We get in, we had the first flight out like 6 AM, um, went to our rooms. And, uh, I was so amazed because, uh, I was in the big leagues. I got, I got my own hotel room. I was so pumped. I got my own hotel room, no roommate. And, uh, went to the ballpark that day in Kansas city and Buck Showalter was our manager. And he called all of us in, and which I thought was a classy move. And he congratulated us on winning the AAA championship. And uh, he said, none of you guys are going to play tonight. I, I know you guys have been up all night, traveled this morning. So you guys just sit in the dugout, watch the game, enjoy it, enjoy your first day in the big leagues. And, uh, yeah, it was awesome. I was, And I had been to, to uh, spring training with the team that, that year in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. So I – I knew some of the guys I was, I was caddying for Don Mattingly and spring training and um, knew a bunch of the guys on the team, Randy Velarde and Roberto Kelly, uh, great guys. And uh, so, yeah, sat there the first day in Kansas city, watched the game. He said, none of you going in, don't worry about it. And then I got my first start the next day. Were your folks there for that? No, they were home watching on TV and, and uh, there was a little sports bar in our hometown that they, they had, the satellite dish back then where they could get, there wasn't an MLB network and there wasn't all this other. So they would go down to the sports bar every day just to get a glimpse of me on TV or in the dugout. And then um, I, I got to start the next day in Kansas city. You know, you had mentioned too, that you'd called your family uh, when it was official that you were going to the big leagues. And, Many of our listeners are probably familiar with your backstory, but some may not be that your father was uh, an NFL receiver and a heck of an athlete in his own right. What was his reaction? Was it any different uh, than one might expect? You know, if I called my dad and he's a, a clothing salesman, he might be like, wait, what? But your dad came kind of from that world. He, you know what? I remember, I, once again, I remember like yesterday and I talked to him on the phone and uh, it was a very emotional call because my dad was very old school. He was very tough on me growing up, um, but I think tough in a good way, um, you know, not pushing me any by any means, but just expecting w whatever sport I played to, to give 100% and have a great attitude and be coachable. And uh, he just said congratulations and that he was proud of me. And then uh, that was a, a pretty cool moment. And then it was it was interesting because after that point, he said, go, go enjoy it. And just be yourself and and play your game because we, you know, when you get to the big leagues and Mark until you get there, you start looking at the guy's names on the back of their uniforms and it's a little intimidating, but he was very uh, positive with me. And he said, Hey, the, the mound's the same distance, the base of the same distance, the lights are a little brighter and there's more people in the stands, but just go play your game. So it was a, it was a great call. And uh, he was very proud that, that all the work I'd paid off ended up that I'd done ended up paying off. JT, do you feel like, it, it, and was it like this, where it was almost like his approval and his uh, excitement for you was something that you you felt like, you know what, that might be the greatest gift yeah. that I could give my dad because he expected, he was that old school mentality. Yeah, he never, um, I think down deep, he, and it's funny because I, I remember talking to my mom and some other friends and they're like, you don't know how proud your dad is, but he never showed that because he never, my dad never wanted me to get comfortable. He never wanted me to think you made it or uh, you'd figured it out. So he, um, yeah, talking to people, your dad's so proud of you. And, um, and then as I got into big leagues and started playing that, that came out more, but I knew, I knew down deep that, that he was proud and um, you, you go through it. I have a son now and when he does positive things, you get so you get really proud for him and, um, it was uh, it was a good a good time. Just the backstory of of your dad, Los Angeles Rams uh, receiver from uh, 1965 to 75. Also very good at the University of Notre Dame too, an All American, <laughs> uh, fifth in the Heisman Trophy in 1964. So that resume is daunting, but also uh, a luxury to be proud of of, of what your dad did. Uh, I want to uh, 
touch on this too because you called you talked about your call up JT um going into that locker room even when you had spring training in Fort Lauderdale as you mentioned that can be daunting what do you remember about walking into that locker room for the first time and seeing your jersey yeah it's it's awesome you know Mark they hang your jersey on the hook and um to see your nameplate above your locker and your your number I was number six in the minor leagues which I kept through my career but I got to the big leagues and the, the club he gave me number 60 because <laughs> half, half the numbers in New York are retired. So he's like, I just thought I'd throw a zero on it, give you number 60. And um, just to see your your name and that uh, above your locker. And then um, I, I, I got to my locker and I started changing for BP. And then if you ever know the New York media, there's 25 reporters around me. And uh, I'll never forget this. The first question they asked me, which is in typical New York style, do you do you think you're going to replace Don Mattingly someday? <laughs> <laughs> I, I said, well, guys, I just got here. I'm just happy to be here. Let's no, I don't like, you know, Donnie, Donnie baseball was, a, a you know, on a, on a path to a hall of fame career. And then he had some injuries, but um, he was great. All in all the veteran guys, you know, you get called up, they're proud of you. And um, so, yeah, that was the first question I got asked. Are you, you going to replace Don Mattingly someday? <laughs> Uh, first, before we get to your first, your first hit, your first homer, because I want to go through those in, in detail. I think it's fascinating because Don Mattingly was 31 when you got the call up. Um, as you mentioned, it's Donnie Baseball. I, I mean, this is a guy that I I watched play and I was like mesmerized of how he handled himself. And he had that old school feel, started as an outfielder, moved to first base. Uh, what was your relationship with, with Don Mattingly? He, he was awesome. And I never met him until I got to, to spring training that year. I was on the 40-man 1990, uh, 1992. And I basically, you know, I, I caddied for him in spring training. I followed him around like a little puppy dog, took ground balls with him. They also had Kevin Moss, who was their backup first baseman at the time. So it was me and Kevin and, and Don. And um, Don Maddie was so good to me. Um, sometimes you call it maybe guys can feel pressure or, or – um, not treat you right, but he, he was great. Never felt uh, like he was worried about me, which, which he shouldn't have been. Um, and I'll never forget that, uh, when the game started and I, I took ground balls him every day and really picked his brain on, and he was such a simple player. I asked him about turning the three, six, three double play and with the pitcher covering. And the only, th- I remember the only thing he ever told me was give the ball to the guy as quick as you can, whether it's a shortstop on the three, six, three, the pitcher covering, and, um, and then in spring training, he, he came up to me one day, we started playing games and he had a little note card or piece of paper and he handed it to me. He said, he goes, here you go. These are all the games I'm not going to play on the road. So you're going to go on these games, <laughs> uh, Fort Lauderdale, West Palm beach. So I did the three hour bus rides, but I couldn't have been happier. And again, to, as you know, I didn't get to really hit with them in the cages cause they had different groups, but uh, I would sit next to him during the spring training games and, and watch him hit and, Back then, I'll never forget, he told me one day, I was sitting next to him, and he says, uh, he's, he used to call me kid, he goes, hey kid, he goes, today I'm going to work on hitting with two strikes. And I said, okay, so he got three at-bats that day, and he went up and took every pitch until he got two strikes, and then he worked on his two-strike approach. And that's the kind of hitter he was, and that doesn't happen anymore nowadays. And sure enough, he did. He got he got three or four at bats, and every at bat went to two. If it didn't go to two strikes, he walked. And then every at bat, he went to two strikes, and he worked on his two strike approach. And then he hit a line drive the other way, or you know, hit a ball in the hole if a guy was on. He was um, he was awesome. He was, and to this day, when I see him uh, through the big leagues, uh, he just we just get a smile on our face. And um, I was very lucky to to be behind him for and, and pick his brain and learn as much as I could for as, as long as I did, but. Um, never say a bad word about that guy. He was, he was awesome. Was there a difference for you when you got to the clubhouse uh, in September of that year, as opposed to being around the same guys in spring training, because now they're in the thick of it and they're winding down. Uh, was there a different feel for you there? Plus the magnitude, of course, of it being New York. Well, yeah, the last thing you said, the magnitude of New York, when you walk in, the, I felt it when I walked in the clubhouse in spring training, you have to remember, uh, George Steinbrenner's there. And the Yankees always had ex-players walking around. Reggie Jackson, Whitey Ford, um, all these guys were – their clubhouse was open. But when I got to the big leagues, I call up and I walked in that clubhouse, I immediately felt like this tension or this um, 
you know, this cloud, like this is the Yankees and there's media hanging out. And um, so I, you know, like, like a good rookie that I was, I just sat with my face in my, in my locker and never went in the training room uh, and just was out there early for stretching and just like kind of did my thing. So I, I'm really, I'm really um, kind of happy and thankful that I was, I came up in that organization because it's, it's like no other organization and you learn a lot and um, it's, it's very intimidating, but I think it, it helps guys out. Yeah, there's certain uniforms that you put on and, and the history uh, as, as you're buttoning your shirt. The history is really huge, and and it really takes into the consideration. Let's talk about your first, your first hit. Um, that is something that you'll always remember. Take us through that situation and uh, how'd that make you feel? So I get my I get my first start in uh, Kansas City the day after I get called up, and um, I hit uh, first at bat. I hit a line drive into left field, left center, and. Uh, Jim Eisenreich was the left fielder and he ran it down like nothing. And I was like, wow, I just smoked that ball. I go, I may never get a hit up here. And then the next at bat, I hit a line drive to first down the line and Wally Joyner snags it backhanded. And so I come back and um, our, our hitting coach was um, um, Hondo, Hondo Howard, remember yeah. Hondo? Oh yeah. And he came up to me and he goes, he goes, kid, that's stupid hitting. Those guys have been playing there for 100 years. <laughs> and uh, so I go 0 for 5 the first game with like three line drives. And so the next, I don't start till we go to Cleveland after that. So I'm 0 for 10 with the Yankees. And uh, the last the last homestand of the year, we're playing the Blue Jays. And Showalter says, you're going to pinch it uh, in the eighth or ninth inning. Tom Hankey was a closer. And... Uh, I was 0 for 10, and we went on a road trip after that. I, I said, man, I would just love to get my first hit in Yankee Stadium. And uh, he threw me like a like a 3-2 split, or, and I hit it down in the right field corner for a double. And I was standing on second base, and so I was 1 for 11, got my first hit in Yankee Stadium. And the last time I'd get a chance to hit in Yankee Stadium as a Yankee, and um, I was on top of the world. And so the next thing I said was, all right, don't get picked off. <laughs> you know, I, I, took, I, I took like a, a two foot lead and uh the crowd was clapping for me and so yeah i was one for ten went to cleveland i got another one other start and i got a hit and i was like two for 14 and my my call up but um to get my my first hit in yankee stadium was was pretty cool down in the right field corner and uh still have the ball sitting in my office and uh i said whatever happens from here i've, I've got a batting average in the big leagues if i never play again up here <laughs> <laughs> I've got an average. So yeah, I was, I was 0 for 10. And so I was one for 11 and then ended up like two for 14. Uh, for our listeners, uh, first off, Tom Hankey uh, has the goggles. <laughs> yeah. I mean, intimidating guy because he threw so hard. And we always hear about velocity these days. It almost felt like when you hit the ball off of him, uh, it, it was like a lead ball. I mean, it yeah. was so heavy. So that double had to feel really good. <laughs> um, it, being in a, a Yankee in, in that uniform, can you put in perspective after you get the hit? Because those are pinstripes. And, and like you said, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned you're sitting on second base, Yankee Stadium. Uh, the fans had to be excited because you're sure. an up-and-coming player. Uh, did you really be able – were you able to take that all in or was it in the offseason? Um, I took it in when I was on second base for that, you know, maybe 15 or 20 seconds. Because I think the I think the crowd gave me like standing ovation because – the one thing about uh, the Yankees and there's some, there's some other teams, uh, the Red Sox are like this, who I played for at the end of my career, we can talk about, but the, the fans there, I mean, they know you from the time you're drafted and that's not the case in all organizations and they follow your career. And I was coming up and progressing and they, they knew, you know, here's, here's this kid coming up and um, won a batting title was MVP in the international league and, so they, they know you. So they, I got like a standing ovation, which was super cool. And, um, I took it all in and then, uh, yeah. And then the next pitch was on its way. And I think, uh, the guy made it, it was two outs. And so thank God I didn't have to try and score from second base. So <laughs> yeah, it was, it, it was one of the highlights of my career. JT, some of the cool moments is, uh, you know, little, uh, reflections of what your career has, but also getting your first rookie card, do you remember mm. that first rookie card? Did you collect them as a kid? And when you first saw it in a Yankee uniform, what was that like? 
It was pretty awesome because, as you know, Mark, you get them the next year, you go to spring training, and there was a stack of them. And I got traded that offseason to the Angels, and uh, there was a stack of them in my locker when I got to spring training. And, yeah, I collected cards as a kid with my dad playing football. I collected football cards. Uh, we used to put them in the spokes of our little bi- of our bicycles, and um, we'd, we'd buy the cards for the bubble gum and et cetera. But I – it's funny you say that because I think when you get a, a baseball card, you're like I finally made it, like, mm-hmm. and then you look on the back and it shows your minor league stats, and um, it, and then it has you know top rated rookie or whatever they they come out and they put those that stuff on. Then you then you read it and it's it's pretty cool. So back then the, the baseball cards was was a big industry and there was a ton of them uh, in our locker and I was I was pretty impressed. So yeah, that was a they, and they were all in the Yankee uniforms from spring training and then. Um, one of them was from an app ad in, in Kansas City that I had. So uh, it was pretty special. You know, when you break in with a team like New York, I would imagine with that fanfare and the like, as you said, are you going to you know, end up filling in and taking over for Don Mattingly? Were you shocked or surprised when the club flipped you to the Angels for Jim Abbott? Well, there's a backstory to that, and I'll share it with you guys. I um, we, The last... Uh, the last series of the year we were in Boston because the Yankees and the Red Sox always finished the series. Both teams are out of the playoff race. Uh, Buck Showalter called me in and he called a bunch of the call-ups and said, I got to try and win this series for the fans. And and you guys probably will not play in this series unless someone gets hurt, this and that. So we said, okay. So it was a free three days and we're in Fenway Park, sitting in the dugout, watching the, get my first taste of the Yankees Red Sox, which is probably the, most intense and incredible rivalry in all of baseball. But um, G G Michael was a GM at the time. Him and Buck Showalter came to me and said, we're thinking about sending you uh, to winter ball to play the outfield, to learn to play the outfield. Because I think they felt um, I had done some good things and they kind of had to do something with me. And I had played some outfield the last few games in Columbus. And um, so they called me in and it's intimidating for a kid, the GM and the manager there. And they said, we want to send you to, I think it was, I was going to go to Venezuela or the Dominican. And they said, um, let us know tomorrow. And I was like, okay. So after that was before the game. So I watched the game, went back to the hotel, called my dad, called my agent. And they both said, tell him, no, you're going to be a big league first baseman. And my agent was like, you're going to win gold gloves in the, in the big league. So I didn't sleep that whole night, went back to the ballpark the next day. Right when I got there, they called me in. And I told him, no, I'm not going. Um, I said, you know, maybe send me to instructional league or something. But I said, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, and I was a, a, a punky little 24 year old. And I said, I'm going to win gold gloves in the big leagues. And I said Ooh. that to him. <laughs> and, uh, and they're like, and then they had some, some words for me and this and that. And then I got, I got traded that off season. So I went um, from the Yankees to the angels. It was myself and, um, Russ Springer was a pitcher, had a great career, and a, a, another left-handed pitcher named Jerry Nielsen for Jim Abbott. So Jim Abbott went to the Yankees because he was a free agent, and I went to my hometown team, uh, the Angels, and I was no longer a Yankee. Was it your decision not to play winter ball, or was it the way you delivered that decision? You think that got you run out? <laughs> I think it was my decision, but um, I, I just remember saying, and I don't know why he said that, but I, I remember saying that, like, <laughs> Cause I talked to my dad and my agent and, and I, I said, I told him, no, I'm going to be a big league first baseman and I'm going to win some gold gloves. And they were like, wow. Like, uh, so anyways, I guess sometimes you have to stand up for yourself in that situation. But, um, and then, um, I was traded in, in that off season of, of 92 to the, to the angels. Yeah. You go to the angels JT and this is a talented club, a lot of youth, uh, but also you had Chili Davis there uh, Chuck Finley, Mark Langston, Tim Salmon, and Jim Edmonds were up and coming players. Yeah. Uh, that's a talented roster. What was that like for you? And obviously, uh, you didn't know anything else but the Yankees and going to the Angels. Uh, tell us how that situation uh, felt. I was excited at first because the Angels were my hometown team. I grew up in Orange County, California, and I was a Dodger fan growing up. And then the Angels um, got better, and I was a Rod Carew fan. I watched Rod Carew and those old angel teams with Bobby Gritch and Brian Downing, Frank Tanana, Don Baylor. I mean, I could go through the whole lineup. And um, so, yeah, I was excited at first. And then I go to go to spring training and uh, the angels were rebuilding and uh, 
some of those veteran guys couldn't have been better. Uh, Mark Langston and Chuck Finley were two of the, my all time favorite teammates. We also had, like you said, Tim Salmon and, and Jim Edmonds, uh, Garrett Anderson, Damon Easley. Uh, we had a bunch of, and I didn't understand at the time because I was excited to, to play, but I could see the veteran side. They were rebuilding and I don't know if they were too happy, but um, we all, we all played and um, I got off to a great start that year and then kind of struggled. The league went around and, and Chili Davis was a big brother to me and really helped me through some, some tough times and um, got sent, got sent out in August back to AAA for a month. It came back in September, but, um, and then spent the next, the next three years there. But um, it was hard. It was hard because I was in my hometown. I'm trying to get established. And uh, the phone's ringing every day. Hey, can you leave me tickets? Buddies from high school and people just coming out of the woodworks. Um, I said, wow, this is really hard going to your hometown team. Because when I was back with the Yankees in the minor leagues and call up, no one really, uh, they're following you, but they're not talking to you. And now I'm out playing for my hometown team. So it was, uh, it was tough at first. And then I learned how to deal with it. And you have to learn how to say no sometimes in a situation. And then people think you change. Oh, he's a major leaguer now. And, but that's not the case. It's just, I'm trying to do a job and get established. Um, this is my job. It's, you know, a lot of people acted like it's a beer league softball league where you're just, yeah. Hey, come in the clubhouse, come out and I'm going to leave you and leave you tickets. And uh, it's much more than that. So it took me a while to get, to get settled, get my feet under me. And, and then um, we had a few good years there. I think it's interesting, JT, and if, if we can elaborate on it too, because this is where we intersected too. I, I was coming up in the Angels organization in AAA around a lot of talent, and I'm just trying to find my way. And then all of a sudden in 1994 in AAA, here comes JT Snow. Uh, from my perspective, just for the listeners, I'm sitting here going, uh, I see the resume, I see the talent, and I watch uh, what you did on the field. And to me, you were a big leaguer. You weren't a triple-A guy. And I think a lot of listeners think that it's just a smooth sailing. And yes, you might go through some adversity, but uh, there was some mental challenges to, that you already alluded to. But when you went to triple-A, it was tough, man, because yeah. you're realizing there's a manager in Buck Rogers it, with the Angels that is in the organizations doing it, sending you down. Uh, how did you deal with that? And what was the point where you felt like, you know what? I got past this and now it's time just to go out there and be a big leaguer. Yeah, I think it was, uh, it's, you know, it's a, it's a splash of cold water in your face. When in 93, I was sailing along the first couple months, I went down for a month. Um, and I went and you know, this more. I went around the league and, and Chili Davis always told me, he's like, first time around the league, they're going to test you with the fastball. See if you can hit it. And he was so right. And I was raking the fastball, hitting it. Second time around, he's like, now they're going to – and then they started throwing me the changeup, and I struggled with it. And, um, you know, my batting average is plummeting. I'm a rookie. I'm playing in my hometown. It's, it's frustrating. Uh, so I'm back in Vancouver, and then I get a September call. And then the next year, 94, I get shipped out from spring training down to Vancouver. And um, like you said, and then it was like, okay, well, I just I just got to keep going out there and, and playing and producing and – a bunch of good guys. We were down there together and you're just hoping that you can do enough to get back. And, you know, that's the thing nowadays. It's like dealing with adversity. You, when they tell you to pack your bags and, and you're, you know, the big league life, and then you're going back to triple a, um, you have to produce. And that's one thing I remember talking to my dad, who was always the first person I would talk to. He's like, well, he goes, make it tough on him. Go down there, put up numbers, make it tough if you can't get up there with them, make them trade you, go somewhere else. So I uh, went down there in 94. And then um, as we all know, the, the strike hit in 94 and kind of wiped out that season. So I went up for, I think a month or two, but I just, just kept thinking about that, uh, that goal and that, you know, playing in the big leagues. And I think, uh, you know, now it's, and I, I tell kids all the time nowadays in the face of the adversity stuff, like just hang in there, keep playing, keep you know, the, the mental side of the game is, is so big nowadays, as we all know, it's like, you just got to stay mentally tough and keep grinding and keep putting up numbers. And um, so that's, that's what the thought was. You know, the cruelty of the game is it's beauty as well. Right. And that is that you do play every day. So when you're going well, 
you want to get out there every day. When you're struggling, you go, oh my God, I got to go out there again. And it may, I, may, right. I may stink again the next day. So as a listener and as a fan, it's, I think it's one of those things that's very difficult to truly appreciate unless you've lived the life that you and Mark Sweeney and, and only a, a handful of others ever lived. It's, it's a real testament to your perseverance and your mental strength to pull that off. What I want to go to, though, is your third year in uh, the Angels organization, because finally what you said to Stick Michael and the guys in the Yankees organization came to fruition. You picked up that gold glove you'd mm-hmm. been saying that you were going to get in your third year. It was the first of five in a row. What did it mean to you to be recognized with that award? Well, it was, it, it was pretty, it was pretty special. And I think, like you said, the first one you win is you're like, man, I'm the, the best in my position defensively. And I, I go back to um, that year in 95 and I, I, I went to spring training and they, and they had like five guys at first base had a bunch of veteran guys. And I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to go have fun and play baseball. Like, you know, quit putting the pressure on yourself. And, and then we, we had a great year that year, our team, and we had a bunch of guys put up a, a lot of big numbers. And um, I remember talking to Mark McGuire at first base when we were playing in Oakland and I was having a good year and he had won a gold glove. He'd actually won it, took it away from Mattingly one year. And I was talking to Mark and Mark said, um, this was kind of at the end of the year. And I was, over over 20 home runs and approaching 100 RBIs and hit about 290. And he said, I think you're going to win the gold glove this year. And I was like, well, we'll see. I don't know. And he made a good point. He says, you know, to win the gold glove, you have to put up numbers offensively so you get recognized. And then you'll win the award. And it, it really stuck with me. And it, he was he was right. They, he's like, they don't give it to someone just if they're hitting 220 with, you know, 10 home runs and 40 RBIs. you got to put up numbers. And so I, I ended up that – that season with over 20 homers and over hundred RBIs. And, um, and he was right. So I remember getting that, that call that I wanted. And, uh, it, it just took me back to all the time I spent taking ground balls. And from the time I was a kid with my dad, hit me ground balls and, um, uh, just working at it. I mean, it's, I tell people it's like anything. It's, you just, if you're going to be good at something, you got to work at it. You got to practice. You got to take pride in it. I always took pride in my, in my defense I think I was blessed with some good hands from my, my dad through some genetics, but just, you have to work at it. Yeah. Every day I worked at it, took my ground balls through to second base and I came up at a good time. This is the other thing where the position of first base and Mark will tell you, it was kind of evolving where it wasn't that the, the big fat slugger that couldn't move over there was more an athletic guy. And it was Don Mattingly's and it was the Mark races and the Wally joiners um, and, and those guys that were really good fielders and they could field and were smooth and could hit. So I, I came up at a, a good time and, um, it was, um, yeah, it was, it was exciting to get that first cold glove was awesome. Yeah. One of six, uh, which is really spectacular. Um, a career nine ninety five fielding percentage in 1998, uh, nine ninety nine fielding percentage. And I cool. say that because I know the type of person you are, JT, it's not numbers for you. It has everything to do with, uh, playing the position the best you can. I've always said this to so many people and, and I'm fortunate to broadcast now and you see some talented defenders. Uh, you are the most athletic first baseman I have ever seen. And there's been some good ones. You already mentioned Wally Joyner, a teammate of mine. Uh, Obviously, Mark Grace, Don Mattingly. Uh, But I always say that athletically, you made a lot of plays that a lot of guys don't get to. So it it wasn't about, hey, I'm playing in this little box here. I'm going to be able to make that play, and I'm good at being around in my area. You had range, and you also threw the ball very accurately. Someone had to help you along the way, other than your dad throwing balls in the dirt, yeah. having a lot of stuff that you, that he has done. Um, does anyone stick out uh, defensively that helped you along the way that I think it, it just uh, basically put a rubber stamp on what you want to try to do? Well, I'd probably go back to my, my college coach in Arizona, Jerry Kendall, the late, great Jerry Kendall, who was an infield guy. And um, he, 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 treated and this is where i think i kind of took off he treated all his infielders first base second base and Jer- uh coach kendall was a great fielder in the big leagues second base and shortstop and he treated us all as infielders it wasn't your first base your third we're all infielders. we all did drills together we all did took ground balls with our bare hands we all 
learned how to throw to the bases. We all learned the correct way to grab the ball, grab the seams. Um, so I would say that it, Coach Kendall was amazing. And he would he would hit us. If we ever wanted extra ground balls, he would hit it. He would hit tough ground balls at us. And he really taught me, you know, I still remember to this day, feet spread, seat down, hands in front, bring it to the belly button. And um, so he was – he was probably my biggest influence and, but it was because he treated everyone. He treated everybody like a middle infield, like a shortstop. He wanted all, all to have good feet, good hands. And then it was when I got into to pro ball and went to the Yankees um, and then went to instruction league the first year, uh, Brian Butterfield, who's now a third base coach with the angels worked with me. And then a couple weeks and then he came up to me after and he said, uh, which was really a, a light bulb moment for me. He said, you go play first base how you want. We're going to leave you alone. You do it the way you want because you, we, we've seen, they try to get me to, to get more on top, throwing the ball to second base, but I was always kind of from the side, just about being a quick release. And so they just left me alone. And after that, I, I was pretty much left alone um, at, you know, from a fielding standpoint, because I think um, some, you know, when you see some guys that know how to, do the position you kind of leave him alone and, and let him play and um so yeah and then i just i just did it my way i guess hmm. jt you made an interesting point because uh that allows you to be athletic and i have a, a simple story you probably won't remember this but uh when we were in vancouver together there was some early work you always do early work in in minor league baseball and i was an outfielder trying to convert to first base so we go out there and they're doing uh balls in the dirt and picks at first base so I remember trying to pick your brain like you did with Don Mattingly. And I'm saying, hey, man, I, I'm, I have a luxury of seeing what you do at first base here. And I said, hey, what do you think about uh, when you're practicing these? And I'll never forget it. You said, you know what? I don't really like practicing uh, picks balls in the dirt because I like to be athletic. I like to react naturally instead of thinking about where I have to go because every throw is different from infielders and so forth. And it really resonated with me because you said, if I practice some more, I start overthinking and I get away from my athletic ability. Um, do you, did you feel that way all the way through your career defensively? Yeah, I think um, that's funny because every, every ball in the dirt is, is different. And I just think there's certain, there's certain things that you want to do, stay down. And, but you know, I, some coaches try to, to work through it. Some try to give what, and I said, it's just about reading the ball and trusting, you know, is it going to hit the grass? Is it going to hit the dirt? Um, some short hops guys would go out and smother. And sometimes I like to give with it. I knew the speed of the runner. So I felt like there wasn't one way to do it. It's just about being athletic and staying down on the ball. And some, some balls you give with some balls you go through and uh, no, and knowing your infielders, what, what the angle that guys throw from, um, the one thing I always did that helped me was, and I learned this, uh, probably in college from coach Kendall in the minor leagues was I always expected a bad throw from the infielder when there was a ground ball, to the infielder and the ground ball to short as I'm running to first base in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking this ball is going to be in the dirt or this, or it's going to be a bad throw. And then when it's a good throw, it's easy. And then if it is a bad throw, you're ready for it. So it's not like you're having to react to something you've already played it out in your mind. So I think that's a big part of it. Of course, of course you have to practice it. I spent a lot of hours picking balls, short hopping, but um, yeah, it was, it was one of those things where you can get too mental and you can freeze up too much because, Oh no, here comes a bad throw and your body tightens and your hands don't work. So you just got to relax. And, and, and I, I was, was working with the giants in my career with some minor league guys at first base. I go to spring training. I said, just, I can't, I can't tell you how to, you know, there's some things picking the ball, stay down, work up, down to up, but just be athletic with it. And just, you don't get any extra bonus points for catching it. Right. And you're going to save your infielder an error. So just, just pick it. Just, I don't care if you have to trap it in your body or, you know, if you have to give with it or go through it, just you feel how you want to do it. And Mattingly was a lot like that too. He was more of a field player. Um, yeah. It's just one of those things that um, I, I got a few free dinners for my infielders, <laughs> from that. Saving, them, <laughs> saving them some air. So, uh, yeah, it's fun. I, but I always had fun doing it. Like, you know, I, I had fun playing defense. I thought it was a, you know, if, if I wasn't going to get a hit that night or something, I'm going to take a, I'm going to take a run or hit away from somebody else and just have fun with it. 
Well, six straight gold gloves, as you pointed out, a couple of them there with uh, the Angels. I want to talk about when you move to San Francisco, but before we get to the trade that sent you to the Giants, when you look back at six straight gold gloves, was there any one that stands out more to you than the others, one that you may be most proud of over all the others? I think there's the, the first one, obviously, in the American League uh, with the Angels. Like I said earlier in the, in the uh, broadcast, I always remember my first – and uh, your first gold glove, it was like, just like when you get your first hit or your first call up, like, I, you know, I've made it all this work. And then uh, your first gold glove is like, well, all this work that I've, I really put a lot of work in um, that people don't see, right? In spring training and in trucks, like on backfields, out there at 8 o'clock in the morning, picking balls and taking ground balls and throwing to the bases. And then um, that one, and then the first one in the National, I got traded after two years, one, two at the Angels, I went to the Giants. And then my first one in the National, I won a gold glove. And uh, Mark Grace from the, the Cubs had won, I think, three or four in a row. And then I took it away from him. And uh, he always gave me grief <laughs> every time I saw him. And he's like, go back to the American League, get out of here. <laughs> and um, so it, it was a really funny story, though, because the when I got traded to the Giants in spring training, I remember um, I was playing first base in a spring training game one day and Dave Martinez, who's now the manager for the nationals was playing for the Cubs and a, a great hitter and a great pinch hitter outfielder. And he was on first base one day and there was a pitching change in spring training. And he looked at me and he said, you're a national league player. And I said, really? I said, what do you mean by that? He goes defense. You can double switch. You play great D. Uh, and so a- after he said that to me, I always remember that conversation and, um, I think he was right. I enjoyed the National League, a little more strategy, double switching. If I didn't start that night, I might be in the seventh inning playing defense. So, um, And then that year, that was my first year at the Giants, and that year I won the gold glove. So I always remember, I always remember uh, Davey Martinez telling me that during a pitching change. Uh, it's amazing what we remember as players, but he said, you're, nas- you're a National League player. You're not an American League player. Yeah, there's certain stories that, especially at first base, that's what fascinated me too. Uh, so, some things just resonate with you because the timing is so perfect. Uh, behind your right shoulder is gold gloves, and I think it's interesting for our listeners to know uh, the great Jim Hughes is the Rawlings gold glove guy that that presents that to you. Yeah. But you you wore a Wilson. Uh, what yeah. was that like? Because you had a certain model that you absolutely loved, uh, but you get the award from the Rawlings. Yeah, you know, we're creatures of habit. We love our equipment. When I got to Arizona, uh, Coach Kendall gave me a first base glove because they had a Wilson contract. So they always got catcher's gear and glove and a first base glove. So he he just gave me a first base glove my freshman year at Arizona. And I, I, the 2802 was the model. And um, the double break around the, around the palm. And I like that. And I stayed with that my whole career and um, never switched. And then the... The year I win my first full glove, and then the years after that, you're on the field uh, pregame for presentation. And um, the first year I won it, I was out there by myself. And, and he gave me the award, and the PA announcer's making the announcement. And under his breath, like out of the side of his mouth, he was like, do you think we could ever get you to switch to Rawlings? And I said, <laughs> I said ah, maybe not. I don't know. Let's see. No chance. And then the next year I got another one, and he'd say the same thing to me. And uh, but he was very cool about it. And, uh, yeah. And so the gloves are Rawlings gold gloves, but, uh, yeah, they, he, he got me, he tried to get me to switch every year on the field. He'd give me the glove and, and say, is this the year you're going to switch? And, uh, the last, uh, the last eight years of my career, I will, I use the same glove and Mark, Mark knows this, the great Mike Murphy in uh, yeah. the clubhouse guy and said he would restitch it and put new padding and restitch it every year. So it was, a, it was almost like a new glove that's already broken in. So I used the same glove for the last eight years of my career. You know what I love about that story? It's the fact that in this day and age, I think a lot of folks think it's always about the money. And I'm sure Ron would have thrown a million nickels at you uh, just to get you in their brand, right? But you had such loyalty to what yeah. had been working for you. I was I just liked the size of it. Other, I tried other gloves, but other gloves were bigger. I liked the Wilson was a little smaller glove. I love the double break around the palm. Mark knows with that. And just mm-hmm. the, the pocket I would form with it. And I could get in the glove easy and, you know, get the ball out for a double play or, or flip into the pitcher. The other gloves, I tried the, the other brands, the Rawlings, the Mizunos. I tried all those. And uh, they just were bigger, and I just, I just didn't like them as much. So I just stuck. The, I used the same model from co- my freshman year of college 
uh, all the way through the end of my big league career. Were you um, taken by surprise at all then with this uh, trade to the Giants? I mean, you'd mentioned Davey Martinez foreshadowing, but that's just the passing remark that yeah. doesn't necessarily bring it to fruition. Walk us through that uh, transaction. In 1996, we had a great year with the Angels in 95. We lost a one-game playoff to the Mariners. And um, then the next year, 96, uh, we all had good years in 95. We kind of underachieved, didn't have as good a year. And um, they were looking to make some moves. I, um, yeah, and I had heard in the that offseason, my agent called me and said, hey, I, you might, um, the Giants are interested in you. And I said, wow. And so, the backstory to that is Brian Sabian, Brian Sabian and, and um, Brian Cashman ran the Yankees minor leagues. They used to give us our meal money. And so Cashman goes to the Yankees. Sabian gets the job in San Francisco. So uh, Will Clark had left the year before, went to, I, I believe, Baltimore, Texas. And um, they didn't have a first base in San Francisco for a year. I was coming off a down year and, and Brian traded for me from the Angels uh, back to, or to San Francisco for a couple of pitchers. And, um, and I'll never forget a buddy of mine said, wow, you just went from the, the best ballpark of climate in Anaheim to the worst in San Francisco where it's foggy and cold and windy, but I went up there with a great attitude. And, um, yeah, so I, a lot of credit to Brian and I spent nine years there and, um, that's really where I, I kind of felt like it was home for me. And I love the national league and, kind of settled in getting to play for Dusty Baker. And we had some great teams and I love the National League brand of baseball and to get out of my hometown where I was, I was pressing a lot because, you know, I, I grew up there to go to San Francisco where, where nobody knew me and uh, just be able to play some baseball and play in the National League. And, and I loved it. Yeah. Nine years in a Giants uniform. And, and that's really when uh, you settled into the big leagues, in my opinion. But I think uh, you have to realize that you got to play with sleeves on in San Francisco because it's cold. That's turtleneck. something that, yeah, the turtleneck up. I mean, you got to be warm, and yeah. that's an adjustment uh, for for our fans out there. But you play in four postseasons, JT, and why I say that is that that's what it's all about. When you make that adjustment, you're a, you're an everyday player, and you're going out there and you're performing at the greatest stage. And you did very well in the postseasons. Uh, what do you remember about that as a giant? Does any one of those stick out? I think 97, we had a bunch of new guys. I came over, uh, Jeff Kent came, Jeff Kent was not playing a whole lot. He was with the blue Jays and the Indians. So he comes over, Brian Sabian trades Matt Williams for Jeff Kent and some other players. And the, the fans in San Francisco are irate. And, um, he said, just stick with me. I, I think I know what I'm doing. Jose Vizcaino came over, played short. We had a we had five new guys um, on the team, and uh, we got Daryl Hamilton from the Rangers, and uh, we were picked to finish last. And we just started playing, and guys gelled, and we were having fun. And we had we had a lot of good guys that were kind of in the middle of their career, but late twenties. I was I was twenty eight, I think, when I went over there, um, and had some big league time. And we just started playing, and then Dusty was managing us, and we were playing, having fun. Dusty kept it loose. We look up in September and we're right there with the Dodgers. And so Dusty had the slogan all year. Why not us? He wrote it on the board and uh, we make the postseason that year. We lost to the Marlins. Um, and then got yeah, 2000, we go to the new ballpark, get to the postseason once again in, in 2002 and in 2003. So we had some, we had some good teams, played with some great teammates and it was just a, it was a, it was a, the environment in San Francisco was just a little more loose and a little more, you know, just take a deep breath and let your breath out and go play baseball. Yeah, I think Dusty Baker had a lot to do with that, to your point. Uh, I look at uh, when you're when I'm in the league at the same time after if you're not in the playoffs, you're watching. And I, and I right. couldn't wait to watch this. Uh, the 2000 Division Series, you have a big moment. In San Francisco and against Armando Benitez, Jeff Kent, as you mentioned, is on base. Also Barry Bonds and yeah. you're pinch hitting three run home run down the right field line. What was that feeling like? Because uh, to me watching it, uh, I was so proud of you. But also it's a moment in baseball. I think a lot of people remember. Yeah, so I didn't start that game. Al Leiter was, uh, Al Leiter was pitching. So Dusty stacked the lineup with righties. And uh, I was actually in the batting cage. You know, the cages down there, Mark, and, and 
uh, Oracle Park. And I was hitting with Doug Mirabelli, our backup catcher. And we were actually playing home run derby in <laughs> the batting cage. And, we were, and, you know, if it hits the corner of the net by the yeah. machine, like that's out, that's out. And so we were playing, if you made three outs, you got to get out. And so we were playing home run derby for like an inning. And then Ron Wotus, our bench coach, came down and says, if Ramon Martinez comes out, who's due up fit that in? If he comes yeah. up, you got a spot because Benitez. So I said, okay. So he left and, and Doug and I said, let's finish our home run derby first. And then, <laughs> so we finished home run derby in the cage. And then sure enough, I, I, I ran up there. He's like, you're hitting. Grab my helmet, bat. And uh, we'd scouted Benitez and he, he went 2-0 on me. And, um. 2 we always tried to throw a fastball away. We'd scout him. So I, I moved up on the play a little bit and looked fastball away. And it kind of ran back over the plate. And I hooked it down the right field line and it went out. And um, yeah, it was it was pretty cool. It was a pinch it. It tied the game. And and so then I come back around the dugout and the place going crazy. And and uh if you ever know Doug Mirabelli, he's one of the best guys ever. He, in the dugout, he's like, he goes, You owe that. He goes, You owe that to me because I got you ready. <laughs> <laughs> with, we were playing home run derby in the batting cage and uh, just little funny stories that only, you know, as, as big leaguers during the game. And then uh, the, uh, the Mets end up scoring the next inning. We lose a game to go back to New York, but uh, yeah, it was, uh, I was never a good, a pinch hitter and you were a great pinch hitter, Mark, you know, the skills, but I was just, I, I was kind of lost up there as a pinch hitter and um, got a two Oh count and just hooked the ball and I smashed it in the right field and, the wind and the fog and the thing went in like the first row and uh, it was crazy. Everyone was going nuts. And to this day, I run into people and I'm like, that's the loudest I've ever heard that ballpark. You know, it was going, it was going nuts. So yeah, yeah, that was our was, first year. That was our first year in the new ballpark and uh, to win the national league West and go to the playoffs was pretty special. It was incredible because your reaction, especially you're, you're yeah. wishing it fair, right? So you're inside that line. Uh, go YouTube it. <laughs> if you haven't seen it, uh, because it, it is, it is an awesome reaction, and just the joy on your face, JT, I, I, it resonates with me because that's when you think of all the hard work, all the things you've gone through, um, so many great things. Uh, that kicks us to 2002. You're going against your Angels, your former club, yeah. in the World Series, and uh, you batted 407 in, in the World Series. Uh, that's something to be proud of as well, but a big moment uh, I think a lot of people uh, remember you by is you – collecting uh yeah. little Darren Baker who's three years old and he's the bat boy and you right. save him by scoring a run take us through that situation that was a, a, I forget what game it was but it was at home and um yeah Darren was three at the time and, and Dusty would let Dusty was great he would let uh kids in the, in the dugout bat boy whatever and uh I had a son the same same age at time but I, I didn't let him in the dugout because I'm like I'm busy playing and so anyways I'm on third Kenny Lofton hits a ball to right center at, at Pac Bell back then. And uh, David Bell, now the manager for the Reds, is on second. So there's one out. He's halfway. I'm tagging. Ball falls in as I'm I'm running three-quarter speed because I'm going to score easy. And here comes David Bell's behind me, piggybacking me. And I see Darren shoot out of the dugout. And I know what he's doing. He's going to get Kenny Lofton's bat. It's in the left-handed batter's box. So as I approach the plate, I grabbed him by the jacket. I kicked the bat out of the way, step on the plate. The catcher's Benji Molina, who uh, ends up catching for the Giants years later. Yeah. And uh, so I score, and then David Bell comes in sliding in behind me. And um, Darren, so the, the reason Darren went after the bat was Kenny Lofton was his favorite player. And he was in the he was in the dugout, I found out later, arguing with the head bat boy, who was, you know, a teenager. And he told me, you can't go get his back because there could be a plate to play, this and that. And when the ball was hit, Darren took off to the, you know, not listening to the bat boy. So I picked him up and uh, it's really cool because I have a picture in my office and nobody's looking at home play. They're all looking towards the outfield and no one knew what happened until they went back and saw it on the news that night. And then it came out, but uh, yeah, Darren was three years old and uh, I did some work with the PAC 12 network the last seven years. Darren played at Cal Berkeley and he just signed this year, 10th round pick by the Washington nationals. And he's, he's got a chance to go pretty far in pro ball. So he doesn't remember the whole incident. Yeah, I, I've interviewed him about it and he didn't remember it. He was three years old at the time. They changed the rules for the bat boys. And next year you have to be 13 out a teenager. And um, I, yeah, it was, it was pretty amazing. And the amazing thing was, like I said, no one saw it. Dusty didn't see it. No one saw it because they were watching the ball hit and they were watching David Bell slide into home. 
Yeah, the Darren Baker rule now uh, at yeah. baseball, which is is really interesting. I love that interview, by the way, when he was at Cal, and you got to do that because it, it really resonates. Uh, by the way, a picture of that is in the Hall of Fame, uh, which it I is. think is it, it, you saving him. I love the reaction because it's a big moment in the game, and it's the World Series, and, and oh. you're going into the, the dugout, and Dusty's looking at his son like, hey, man. I mean, what are you doing? What are you yeah. thinking? And he's only three years old, but he gives you a little high five. Then afterwards, you give him a little uh, knuckles and, yeah. and say that. What was the interaction like uh, with you and Dusty and also he, Darren? He looked at he looked at Darren like a dad and look at his kid, like you said, like, what are you doing? And then uh, he just said, thank you. He's like, thank you, thank you. And then I said, oh, no problem. And I said, luckily I had a, my son was that age. So he used to like run around grabbing kids and, um, yeah, but it, it it was pretty funny, and then but not till like after the game that people got to see the highlight of it. Really, it's pretty incredible. Like people come up to me now all the time, and um, it, there could have there could have been ugly at the plate if because I think Darren was going to grab the bat and then probably run back across home plate, not around the catcher, but back. And David Dahl came in slide, and I remember Benji Molina and the home plate umpire was his name was Mike Riley. Yeah. Long time. And they were yelling, get him out of here, get him out of here. And it's like, <laughs> here we are in the World Series. And we're like, got this little kid running across home plate. And, uh, but that was, you know, that's, that's how loose our, our clubhouse and our dugout was. Dusty let the kids in the, he wanted the kids to be around their dads and uh, in the dugout and stuff. So it was, is it maybe a moment we'll never see again. Uh, I remember that uh, that World Series for that moment. I also remember it for the Barry Bonds home run in Anaheim. Mm. I, I mean, that that was one of the farthest balls I've ever seen hit, and the reaction of Tim Salmon really resonates yeah. with me. Um, uh, let's speak of, of your performance, though. What did you feel like at the grandest stage, hitting hitting over four hundred in that series? It's funny because um, I was a. 270 career hitter but in the postseason there was just something about the postseason where I felt like it was fun and relaxing and you have a lot of, of adrenaline and a lot of this goes back to talking to my father and he's like you got to realize when you get in the World Series you're going to be amped up you're going to be just relax and play like it's any other game and we know during the season you're grinding and you know it's in August and in, uh, in Montreal where there's no and now you're on the biggest stage and so I just had a ability to kind of relax in the postseason and play, have fun with it. And I, I've always told people, I think in the postseason, guys that, that play the game the right way, that maybe during the season gets overlooked, like maybe I hit a ground ball to second, get the guy over to third with nobody out, or maybe I hit a fly ball to score the guy from third on a sack fly, or I get a bunt down, or I make a defensive play. Now, when everyone's watching, it, it almost, that gets um, amplified, right? People are like, well, wow, he did his job. He did this. And during the season, that gets lost sometimes. But it's all about just relaxing. You know you're going to have that extra shot of adrenaline. And it's, it's about having fun. And I love playing in the postseason. There's nothing like it. And my From the time I started playing in college and through different coaches, I, I always took the approach to what can I do to help the team win this game tonight? Like some, some nights you're going to go for four, but you make a play. Or, and I think in the postseason, that's – that comes out. What can I do this game tonight, the biggest game of the year to, to help us win the game? It might, it might be a ground ball to the infields back with a man on third, you hit a ground ball to get the guy in and you end up winning by a run. So um, I love playing the postseason. I, um, I thought it was just super cool. The stakes are high, the intensity is there, the, the energy is there. And I almost went the other way and just kind of relaxed more and not treat it like just any other game like and then when you when you do the I, I guess what I'm saying is when you do the little things in the postseason people take notice and then like wow this guy can play a little bit you know who took notice is the Giants fans uh you became a fan favorite uh and it and it's easy because of your work ethic what you put into the game I can easily say that too because the Giants fans are very smart about the game but also uh the effort that people put in uh, yeah. You were declined salary arbitration in 2006, and you signed with the Red Sox. It was time to move on. And uh, what do you remember about that situation going over to the Red Sox in, in 2006 and leaving the Giants? Terry Francona was a manager, and Terry is a, a U of A guy. And I was at U of A um, six or seven years behind him. But he he called me, and I was 
38 years old at the time. And they were, they had just gotten Mike Lowell and Josh Beckett from the Marlins. They were going to move Kevin Euclid to first base. He said, we want to bring you in and, and mentor Euclid. And he goes, you'll, you'll play, you know, a couple times a week. And so um, they made, they, they, it's funny because he made me an offer and I said, no. And then he called me the next day and he goes, well, double it. And I said, I'm there. And, uh, <laughs> And so I went to Boston and I did it because I wanted to play for Terry and I was only there for three months, but or three months, but to this day, one of the best managers I've ever played for. And he was unbelievable. And I, you know, I got a chance to experience the Fenway guy and I knew my role going in. I was at the end of my career and I played a little bit. Um, and then our center fielder, Coco Chris broke his finger and then they moved Eucalyptus to lead off. And the guy had like a 500 on base percentage. Yeah. And Mike Lowell's having a good year and um, just some, some really got to play some really good guys and go back to the East coast and um, didn't, didn't play a whole lot, but uh, it, you know how this is. You go from a young guy and the, the course of your career, you go from a young guy. And now I'm a, now I'm an older guy, like and young guys are talking to me and I'm working with the Euclid at first base and helping him and um, just giving some, some advice and some, um, some wisdom to some young guys. And I really enjoyed it. And then I was there three months, uh, they had to make a move and, and they released me and I went home, but, um, it kind of, my career kind of came full circle, started with the Yankees in with the Red Sox. And then I played for my hometown team angels, and then got a chance to play for a team that I didn't like as a kid, the giants, cause I was a Dodger fan and an angel mm-hmm. fan growing up. And then, so it, looking back after it was all said and done, it was, it was a pretty cool ride. Like, and the Yan- the Yankee Red Sox, I got to see both sides of it. And uh, I tell people this day in baseball that that's the most intense rivalry. The Giants and Dodgers comes close, but those East Coast fans and what it means to them is um, is is really unbelievable. And I, I had a I had a great time in Boston. Had a little apartment about a half a mile from Fenway. Walked to the ballpark every day, and um, so. It was, it was fun. It was a good time. And, and it was all – and I love playing for, for Terry. Terry was a great guy, Terry Francona. You know, after you're done in Boston, um, September of uh, 2008, after what I think, if I read it right, JT, was about a year or so out of the game, uh, you get an opportunity to, to hang it up officially with the Giants. Walk us yeah. through that and, and how that transpired. Brian Sabian wanted me to come back and retire as a Giant – I was doing some work with the team, doing some roving and uh, some special assistant work. And I told him I didn't want it. I, he didn't have to do it. I didn't, I didn't want to do that. But he's like, no, I, uh, I, I want to do it. You spent nine years here, your big part. And uh, so, yeah, they signed me. They signed me for one day. I put the uniform on and took the field. And uh, then they, they pulled me out before the first pitch. But uh, I was rolling the balls to the infield. Rich Aurelia and uh, Omar Vizquel was there. And I forget it was at second. But they all started throwing balls in the dirt at me. And, um, I, and I, Vizquel was the first guy to do it. He threw a ball in the dirt and I picked it. And then I really was playing third and he throws one in the dirt. And I was like, okay, these guys are now messing with me. So I picked them and then, uh, they, they put, um, I'm not sure who their, who their first baseman was at the time, but they brought him in the game. So I got to retire as a giant, which was cool. And, and Brian and I go way back and he wanted to do that for me. And I, I told him he didn't have to do that. I was, but uh, he wanted to do it. So it was kind of a, a cool gesture. Uh, it was against the Dodgers, which I think is another classy move, too. Uh, yeah. What was that like uh, coming off the field, JT? What do you remember from that moment? Just the fans, like it, it, the uh, standing ovation. And it it comes full circle, like I said earlier, from the, my first hit with the Yankees, standing on second base in the Yankees Stadium, standing ovation. And then the Giants gave me, fans gave me standing ovation as I, as I ran off the field uh, that last time. So and that's like – like full closure. I, when I got released from the Red Sox, I had a couple offers. My agent had called me and a couple teams wanted me as a left-handed guy off the bench or whatever. I just thought it was time to go. So it, it put a little closure to it, but um, yeah, it was, came full circle. Before we uh, follow up with what's what's next for you, I think what's fascinating is you walk off that field, you get the ovation, but also you're honored by the San Francisco Wall of Fame. Um, this yeah. is an organization that has Willie Mays, Willie McCovey, a lot of uh, unbelievable stars of the game, and you're part of that. What did that make you feel like, uh, especially that organization honoring you with that award? Yeah, the Giants do a great job with it. their their clubhouse doors are open, you know, and, and 
in spring training when I was there, Willie Mays in the clubhouse, McCovey, Orlando Cepeda comes back, Gaylord Perry. I mean, it's it's a who's who. You know, Will Clark would come work with us. And so to be, yeah, they, they started like a, a wall of fame out there on uh, down the left field line on King Street. And uh, there's um, it, the wall is growing now, but it, it's just guys that have, have made an impact in, in San Francisco and then have had a career there, whether they're an all star or winning, you know, gold gloves or some postseason history. But um, it, it's pretty funny because now I get uh, text messages from buddies that go to the game and they, they see the wall and, uh, you know, they're, they're pretty funny with me. Like, Oh, it looks like they let anybody on this wall. You know, <laughs> I said, yeah, I, go, I, I had to pay him to get, get me up there. So, um, the, the giants do a great job that the giants are very old school. They're very East coast. When they came to San Francisco, 1958, they, uh, them and the Dodgers, they, uh, they do a good job. The player, the fans, as Mark knows, the fans are knowledgeable. They're knowledgeable. West coast fans are kind of an East coast mentality they're tough um watching those games at candlestick and the fog and cold all those years and now at oracle park and uh, they know the game and it's a it's a great place to play and it's a, a they, they love they love their players you know jt one of the things that i think the game affords you and other players is a platform uh to help other people and it's always fascinating to me when guys like you go ahead and do that uh after you're done in 2008, you have some time to yourself. One of the things you're involved with is the Snow Foundation. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, my sister uh, and I started. My my younger sister Stephanie lives in St. Louis, just outside of St. Louis, and her daughter Raquel was born with a very rare type of type one diabetes, which uh, can lead to hearing loss and eyesight loss. She's now going into her senior year in high school and. She's almost legally blind. And we started this about eight years ago when she found out and we are doing some research. The disease she has is called Wolfram syndrome. It's very rare. It only affects one in 150,000 that have type one diabetes, usually in kids. And um, so we started doing uh, some research and doing some fundraisers and the doctors at Washington University in St. Louis are studying this. And it's, it's one gene in your body that goes bad. Um, and they usually find it at your optic nerve in your eye. And so we've been raising money through uh, fundraisers and we're, it's a little less known disease and it's really hard to get the awareness out to people, but we do some fundraisers and we've raised over a million dollars in about eight years, which doesn't sound like a lot uh, because the small diseases are hard to raise money, but every penny we've ever made has gone to the doctors to continue their research. And they really feel they've, they've narrowed it down. They know which gene this is in your body. And we feel in Raquel's lifetime that they can reverse or halt the progression. And the doctors think that she, she may see again. So my sister, Steph and I started this with, with my help through baseball and uh, my, my dad's help. He was a broadcaster with the Rams back in St. Louis. We've met some great people and uh, we've taken this to the next level. We've been to Europe a couple of times to talk to doctors over there. And uh, we're just trying to raise as much as we can and, and give it back so that the, these kids can live a, you know, a healthy life. And you can go online to snowfoundation.org. My sister really runs it. She's an amazing person. And um, my niece was just out here visiting a couple of weeks ago. And uh, I wish everyone would have the chance to spend uh, 10, 15 minutes with somebody that can, can is almost legally blind and get there. She has an amazing perspective on life and she doesn't feel sorry for herself. And she's, um, she's an amazing, uh, little girl. And, uh, I, I always cherish when I get a chance to visit her cause it puts everyone's and puts my life in a different perspective. So, um, she, she's amazing. She's a, a wonderful human being and we're going to, we're going to keep going until we find a cure. JT, uh, we'll put it on our website, all the information, but how can awesome. people help? They can go to the snowfoundation.org and you can, uh, make a donation. You can, we have some fundraisers that we do. We're doing a golf tournament in St. Louis. And, um, you know, like, and my sister says every penny counts and it, it's, it, you know how it is, Mark, after you're done playing, it's hard to ask people for money. Uh -huh. Um, I'm never comfortable with it, but people are so gracious. And, um, uh, like my sister says, we'll take a dollar, we'll take $5. We'll, we'll take, you know, anything. We've got a lot of, a lot of great feedback. So they can go to the, the website and go to our foundation, make a donation because it, it all adds up. 
Well, if you look at it too, uh, JT, um, after all the charities, all after a, a very successful career, as Mike alluded to, what's next for you? What are you looking to do? Are you trying to stay in the game or how, how are you uh, passing your time? Yeah. So when I was done, I did some work with the Giants and coaching and some roving and I did some broadcasting. And um, I think I, I like the broadcasting aspect. I love being around the game. I, I worked some games with the Giants early on. I spent seven years with the Pac-12 Network in college baseball. Uh, right now, this year, I'm doing 20, uh, actually 22 games for the Sacramento River Caps, which is a Giants AAA team here in Sacramento. And um, we do the weekend games on TV, getting some great experience, done a handful of Giants games this year. So I think, um, you know, I've dipped into a lot of things, but I love, uh, I love broadcasting the game and I love – teaching people about the game. I, I try and keep it simple. And when you watch a game, not everybody knows a game like you and I do, but if people give you good feedback, well, you know, Oh, that was a great point you made. I never understood, you know, Hey, first and second, bump the ball down to the third baseman, you know, people, mm-hmm. stuff like that. Or so I, I like the broadcasting. Um, it's fun to be around the players. It's um, fun to talk to the managers and it's fun. I love just calling the game you know, the three hours that day, how the game unfolds. We never know what's going to happen. And um, it's really fun for me to relay that to the fans watching. And hopefully they can learn something after each broadcast. I'm glad you chose that path uh, because (laughs) I I really am. And I say that I'm not even kidding around because I I feel the same way for Mark because there are – opportunities out there for guys like you who've had long established careers to do many other things. And the fact that you're interested in staying in the game and teaching those of us on the outside as fans about the game, I think that's great. I I think it's wonderful you've chosen, uh, at least for now, to explore that avenue. Well, thanks. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I think there's a way to do it. My dad did it for a long time and I I watched him work and uh, the Giants have a couple of the best. Mark knows them. Uh, Dwayne Kuyper and Mike Kruko are kind of some of the best in the game. And they bring a fun atmosphere to the game. Um, you keep it simple. You you use vocabulary and situations where people at home can understand it. Because I never realized it till after I was done playing. What a big part uh, baseball plays in people's lives. And I know it's seven o'clock every night, and I'm getting sucked into it now. The Giants are in a playoff race. I'm turning the game on at seven o'clock, and I'm I want to watch uh, certain guys pitch, and I. You know, we just got Chris Bryant from the Cubs. I want to watch Chris Bryant hit. And um, it's a big part of people's lives. And I, you don't realize that when you're playing because you're in a bubble. You're worried about your job. But now broadcasting, you bring you can bring so much enjoyment to people because the Giants fans go from, you know, Santa Barbara all the way up to Oregon and then over to Reno and into Nevada. And people are watching. And to be able to have them sit down and watch a game and, and you bring that to them and make it enjoyable for them is, is really cool. And uh, getting a lot of good feedback and it's a big part. It's a part of my life now. I like turning the game on and watching the game now. And uh, people are getting their dinners ready. We've got to eat dinner, you know, before seven. So we get the game on. And uh, I think it's, it's fun to, to do the broadcasting. Yeah. I think it's fascinating too. You mentioned Kruko and Kipe who are arguably the best in the game. Uh, yeah. Also John Miller, you see yes. Fleming. Uh, you guys have, a great group, but you would be a great addition to it. And why I say that, JT, you're, you, you've you've dealt with everything. You've dealt with adversity. You've dealt with uh, uh, being able a six-time Gold Glover. But the only thing that's uh, really difficult, and I get to do this too, is you have to put makeup on every single day. <laughs> and man, I tell you what, that that that's the worst part of my day. But man, if we can be a part of this great game, uh, we try to do it. But uh, JT, yeah. I appreciate all the time. I appreciate you as a teammate and the way you always uh, represented the game of baseball, man. And I, I mean that in, in all sincerity. Uh, you are a pro's pro. And uh, I think a lot of people that are listening to this podcast understand you did it the right way. Well, I appreciate that. And I think, you know, Mark, when uh, and my dad always told me this, he said, when, when you retire, uh, people aren't going to remember how, what your batting average was or how many home runs are guys, but they're going to remember – uh, the way you play the game, or if you're a great teammate. And you were a great teammate, and uh, that's one thing that was always instilled in me from my dad from an early age is uh, show up every day, smile on your face, play hard, and, and be a good teammate. And then, you know, now when you have these reunions is and now you run into guys, as I have broadcasting now, guys I play with are now coaching and the the, the reminiscing, and uh, it it's it's nice to know that, uh, you know, you, you, you try to do it the right way. And uh, I think that's that's the way we did it, and I think it, it pays off. Well, we appreciate the time, and we'll look forward to seeing you, you on television. 
Okay, thanks guys. I appreciate you having me on and I can't wait to watch this and listen to it. All right, JT, thanks very much. JT Snow, 16 okay. years in the big leagues, six gold gloves guy, hit over 400 in the 2002 World Series. And I highly recommend you check out YouTube and Follow those JT Snow <laughs> postseason highlights. They're fantastic. Also, help with his charity. You get a moment. Check out the snowfoundation.org. JT, once again, thanks so much for coming on with us. You got it, guys. Thank you. Well, folks, thanks for checking out Major League Beginnings presented by Bet Online. And if you had as much fun as we did, please go ahead, hit the subscribe button anywhere you usually download your podcast from. You pick the platform, including Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, whatever you like. We're just glad to have you aboard, and we'll see you next time.